here we are. School is in session. It is officially fall. People are at work. Some people are at work. Subways are filling up sometimes. Broadway's lights are shining. And there are even a few tourists here that weren't here last year. New York is opening up. And even here at church, well, we too, we have new AV equipment that we are testing out today in preparation for next week. Better microphones so that we can all hear each other better and better technology for worshiping together both in the sanctuary or at home or wherever you are. Next week, we are preparing for some of you, those of you who wish to join us, to join Paul and me and our new friend Matt. He's in the balcony running all of this here in the sanctuary. I'm going to say a few words about some of those protocols in a little bit. But first, we are we're here. We're ready to move on. We are anxious to get back to normal. Some of us are more anxious than others, I imagine. And I imagine that all of us are anxious about different things. Some are anxious to get going again. Others are anxious that we're getting going perhaps too soon. And in the midst of all of this is the question of, are we ready? Are we really ready? If we are to be really ready to move forward, we have to really know where it is that we have been. For those of us who don't know our history, my favorite high school history teacher drilled into us, we are doomed to repeat our history. And so before we move on to next Sunday's church homecoming, a day I know so many of us are looking forward to, a day I think all of us were hoping would be even more than what it is now. Maybe it would be a faithful act for us today to take stock of all of where we've been and what we've lost. To take just a moment in the midst of all of this loss of this past year and a half, to take this moment, perhaps this week, to do the things that we hate doing most, to mourn to grieve, to actually acknowledge how much pain we have experienced, to hurt, and to not move to making it okay, but to just say that we hurt. Some of us are ready to return to church in person next week, and as we journey toward that resurrection, Resurrection, a perfect, faithful word we know. Perhaps we could take this week, or even just this one hour, to sink into our grief of the past year. Grief that comes from over 600,000 Americans in total, more than the population of the state of Wyoming, and currently more than 2,000 Americans a day that have died from COVID. That's one measure of what we've lost. Over 20 million American jobs were lost due to the pandemic. That's another measure of what we've lost. Some people have moved. Others have changed jobs or schools. We haven't hugged anyone in this sanctuary or shaken hands with someone we just met. Those are other things that we've lost both quantitative expressions that can be measured with numbers like lives and jobs and income, and qualitative ones, relationships, friends, time, life, that can be measured not by counting them, but by the quality of them. And these qualitative ones, these are the ones that interest me today because they're the ones that are about faith. They're the ones our faith can measure, or that indeed may measure our faith. In his letter to his congregation included in our New Testament, Pastor James tells us that if any are suffering, we should pray. Are any of you suffering? If one is, then we should all pray. Are any of you cheerful? Then we should sing. 
If one is cheerful, maybe we can all sing. Are any of you going through the ups and downs of suffering and cheerfulness, the cycling, the, cycling, the suffering with cheerfulness, or maybe cheerfulness with suffering, of laughter through tears, of singing a sorrowful song or offering a sympathetic prayer? If so, maybe we can pray and sing. The letter of James that we now have is an ancient book of wisdom. Commonly, it has been identified with the earliest and closest of Jesus' followers. It's a book of a lot of grace. And in its five short chapters, it includes more than 100 instructions, 100 mandates to pray when suffering, to sing when cheerful, to ask others to pray and even to anoint you when you're sick, to be there with one another and to pray for one another that we may indeed be healed. James's theology is both pastoral and liberating. He assures his reader that the simple prayer of faith will heal us, and that anyone who has committed any sins will be forgiven. This is good news for the people of James's time. It's good news, too, for us here in pandemic time. For what we all know is that the pandemic did not come as a flood from an angry God seeking to right the world. And yet it has washed over all of us, hasn't it? It has been like a flood. COVID has been the air that we have been breathing, the ground on which we are standing. And here we are, breathing and standing still. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, another ancient pastor, the one we now simply call the psalmist, that pastor writes, then we would have been swallowed up and the flood would have swept us away. We have not been swallowed up. And for this, we can be cheerful. But we are also not without a few scars, not entirely without loss. So what if we trust our faith enough that faith itself could be faithful? Faithful enough faith that will do the hard work for us. To take the lessons we practice every year from Good Friday to Easter Sunday, from an upper room to a cross to an empty cross. We journey from gathering to being alone to sorrow, to grief, to hope, and to resurrection. The pandemic isn't going to end in a nice, neat three days. It's not going to end next week when some of us gather back here. But there is hope, and you know it, because you know the story. You know that Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. You know the story that Jesus Christ is risen today. You know that death doesn't get the last word, that God does, and that God's word is one of love and healing and hope. And so what if we stick with that faith, trusting that God will have the last word, that gives us the time, the trust, to measure what we've lost, to confess our sins, because all sins will be forgiven, to name our pain, because all will be healed, and to trust in God, to work in God's way, not ours. Thanks be to God for that. Friends, when we return to this sanctuary next week, it will look and feel and sound different from how we left it on March 8th, 2020, when we last gathered. It will be very different than March 1st, 2020, when we last formed a circle around this sanctuary and shared the celebrate of communion. We have had a task force working designing protocols and communications, signing people up to be ushers, and to keep us all safe, 
We have designed a four-stage reopening plan, the details of which you'll be receiving this week, and that will be on our website, that will be on our building, and that will be signed and messaged frequently. We're taking it slow. The road of faith is long, and God is always with us. We don't need to rush. We need to be faithful and to protect those who are on the margins, our friends who are sick, or have immune-compromised systems, or who simply are too young to receive a vaccine. You're going to hear a few of these protocols from Nathan in just a little while, but allow me to say that it will feel different, and there's a loss in this too. And I hear that, and I feel it too. To give you just a snapshot of what next week will look like, when you arrive, we are inviting fully vaccinated adults to join us here in the sanctuary. Proof of your vaccination will be required, as it is for anyone entering our building at all times. While you are inside our campus, your church home, we ask you to wear a mask at all times, over your nose and over your mouth. There will not be moving around once we are in, and we are limiting the total time that we are in this space because these windows, they do not open. Our airflow is restricted, and we want to limit our exposure to things that can harm us. Worship will be shorter. We will not be singing yet. We won't be sharing the peace by hugging and shaking hands. We won't be moving around the sanctuary. We're going to have to draw smiles on our masks to show everybody how delighted we are and practice our smizing to share our love. It's going to feel different. Fellowship will be outside while we can, and only the sanctuary will be open on Sunday morning, which means there will not be access to the kitchen, or bathrooms at this time. We've designed four stages of reopening that will keep us safe and that we are hoping to move through as quickly as we can, as quickly as it feels safe to do so, knowing that together we will get there. Friends, a long time ago, Pastor James wrote to his people, and he told them that it seems dark today, and the world's a mess, and Christ has died, and Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. 2,000 years ago, the world was very different. 18 months ago, the world was very different. But hope is eternal. And so if one of you is suffering, then we should all pray. And if one of you is cheerful, then we could all sing. The world will do what the world does all around us. But we, as people of faith in this world, have a moment to sit as humans, as creations of our all-creating God. The world can wait. We will return. Resurrection will come. Easter teaches us every year. And maybe in that faith, the faith of Good Friday, the faith of, were you there when they crucified my Lord, the faith of sorrow, the faith of Mary and Peter and the women that were at the cross, the faith of mourning and remembrance. Maybe we can be there for just this moment, maybe for this week, and know that others are moving through it as well. Trust in God, Jesus says. Trust also in Jesus. Peace be with you.